functional program. So, introductory lecture, lecture today, we discuss types of different programming paradigms and the difference between functional programming and other programming styles and one of the leading functional programming language. So with that lecture, we're going to start a new journey functional programming. So I know that so far you will learn the imperative programming and so the this lecture on words I'll teach you how do you shift from typical imperative programming into the different programming style or the paradigm for functional uh, program. So I'll refer one book in this course, Introduction to Programming and Problem Solving Using Scala. So electronic copy of the book I have shared with you. So I recommend all of you to read the entire book. Let's start our journey of functional programming. You know, computer science is a very huge area right now that teach not only computer. So computer science teach about algorithms and the method of solving those algorithms, how to specify those algorithms and how to optimize those algorithms and so on. So it's similar like when you say astronomy, so people might think it is about a scope. So when you say computer science, it's not obviously we need the computer in the computer science area, but computer science is somewhat larger area. So mainly that is all about solving problems by using algorithms. When we come back to the computer, you know, basically computer has inputs and the output. Then there is a device called computer where it takes that input, do processing and create an output. So the result will be stored in the memory or some other storage device. And the processing happens in the CPU. So in the computer, in basically some device which takes some input and creates some output. So the functional programming is similar to that. We will discuss in a minute. When you take the CPU in the computer, you know, we take the data and programs especially programs call it as instructions. We store those instructions in the memory, plus the data in the memory. CPU fetch the instruction. Based on the instruction, they fetch the data and they process the data and store the results again in the memory. So when computing, memory is kind of, you know, very important place where we store data plus instructions. You know, in the basic computer structure, in the low level, what we have is hardware. So on top of the hardware, we have some software layer, we call it as basic input output system. So using that basic input output systems, so people have implemented some kind of software, we call it as operating systems. So then we write applications on top of the operating systems. Our applications usually talk to the operating systems and it converts or it passes that instruction to the basic output basic input output system towards the hardware to perform our action. So as an application, 
they may not see the real hardware. They are see what we call it as abstraction, some kind of abstracted layer provided by the operating system to the application. So by doing that, we simplify implementing the application. Programming is something what giving instruction to the computer to perform some set of actions. So we can give instructions in in ab abstract manner on top of application layer, or we can give instructions in the lower layers. So programming is somewhat we call it as giving instructions to the computer to do or to perform meaningful action. If you do that instructions or if you, if we give that instructions in the lower layer, so we call it as, we call, the, call it as machine code. In the machine code, basically pass the low level instructions usually one zeros to the machine. At the initial stage of computing, we did that. So passing that low level instruction is very inconvenient for humans, even though it's convenient for machines. So we need to have some abstraction. So at initially, the computer scientists have developed some kind of program, call it as assembler, all of our assembler is to convert some meaningful instructions to the machine, to the code, machine code. So in other words, some people have developed a program that can identify or that can understand some codes, oh, such as add, subtraction, move, jump, like that three letter code. So this three letter code can be converted into the corresponding machine code of the computer. So then people can write a program using this three letter code and give that file to the compiler, what you call it, assembler, that convert it to a machine instruction. So then we get a flexibility to writing the code in little high level language, so we call it as assembly language. So that's how the programming starts. So after that, computer scientists have think about developing efficient methods or the efficient way of abstraction to handle programming. So they have developed different levels of programming languages, what we call it as programming languages. Idea or the concept of all those programming languages are to give instructions to the machines in the human readable, efficient formats or human readable efficient methods. So history start from the assembler to right now, people have developed thousands of different programming languages to do programming. Some people kind of restricted yourself to a single programming language. So like you might prefer some programming language you learn first, but as a programmer, you should be able to handle any kind of programming language. So if you learn the concept of programming and different, what we call it as different programming paradigms, so after that, you should be capable of learning any programming language in short period of time. So in your university life, you have started programming with 
what you call it as imperative programming. So we give instruction there one after other. And then you learn a little bit of, I guess, object oriented programming. And now you are learning functional programming. So there are some other paradigms for logical programming as well. Most of the programming languages of, in the computer kind of imperative programming. So whatever programming language used at the low level, it converted into the machine code. Machine code execute those instructions one after other. It is like a sequence, it's imperative programming. Basically tells the system how to do that. Actually computers are machines in low level, we need to tell the computer how to do these things. So if you want to add two numbers in computer, so let's say we use assembler. So first of all, we have to load these two numbers from the computer memory to a temporary storage device for registers using an instruction called move. And then we need to execute an assembly code called add and the result will be saved in a different register. So then we have to move that value from that register back to the memory to storage. So all those things we have to tell, move two numbers, move first number, second number, add those two, move the result back to the memory. Everything we have to tell the system one by one. So that is what we call it as imperative programming. Imperative programming, programmer specifically states how to do things. Actually, in the computer, we need to do so. But people have developed different programming languages. Well, it has declarative programming language. So in those language, we don't need to tell the computer how to do things. We tell the computer what is to be done then computer de decide how to do that. So that is simple for some, to solve some functions. So programmers can tell the system, this is what I want. This is what is to be done. Then programming language convert those instructions to the imperative code and tell the computer what, how to do things. So programmer tells what is to be done and compiler tells what is how to do things. So most of the programming language in the world, we can basically categorize itself into these two categories, imperative or declarative. So I think so far you have learned kind of imperative programming. So this is the course where you are going to learn declarative programming. So one of the declarative programming method is functional programming. Right. So Wikipedia is defined the imperative programming as this. It says imperative programming is a programming paradigm that uses statements that change a program states. It consists of series of commands of computer to perform. It focuses on describing the details of how a pro program operates. So instruction will operate or execute one after other, and the result of these executions store in the states, different states in the memory. And finally it arrives the results. Opposite of that paradigm is functional programming. So functional programming follows the imperative programming style. Functional programming bones in very early stage of computer science due to a kind of mathematical language developed by uh, some researchers this language, they call it as a lambda calculus. So they use the letter lambda to define this mathematical 
functions or the methods. So it started with computer science somewhere around 1930, 1940 period. So at the beginning of computing or computer science or computers, somewhere in 60s, so people knew about functional programming. But imperative programming got popular like C. But when it comes to this cloud computing era right now, with different microservices and huge programming developments, people now thinking back on functional programming paradigms and functional programming languages. Functional programming, Wikipedia says, functional programming is the way of writing software application only using pure functions. The main value of the main, main, main feature of the pure function is its immutable values. In the functional programming, we develop what we call it as functions. So which takes the inputs and outputs. So for same inputs, those functions always creates same output. So there are kind of evaluation of those mathematical functions basically may not have any side effects. So if you want to build a pure function and programming applications, we need to divide our problem into a small set of what we call pure functions. So there are different types of functions we will learn. So in basic building block of functional programming is the pure function. Pure function has no side effects, as I said. It means it does not read anything from the outside world or it does not write to anything to the outside world, like states. They take some inputs at the beginning of the functions, a, and they return some outputs. That's it. If you call this function x number of times, always they produce the same result, let's say y. So in order to understand that, we need to, we can think about some pure functions and kind of other functions. So let's take function like sine function in the mathematical libraries in any programming language. When you call uh, that sine function sine a, with million times, the result is same, you know. So we have a given set of arrays, let's say elements, numbers, and we call maximum function, max value from this list of elements. So if you call that maximum function with this input array, it, from infinite of time, all the times it produces same output to the same input, obviously. So those type of functions like maximum, minimum, mathematical functions, they are pure functions. Pure functions only take inputs and produce some outputs. If you call this function million times or any number of times, it creates the same output to the same input. So when you think about some function like in the system classes of programming language, it, like current time functions. So when you call that function, the result is different from time to time. Maybe in the random class, in any programming language, there are some functions called next int. So when you call next int, it returns a random value. Next time when you call next int, it returns a different random value. So such functions are not pure functions. Then in functional programming, you might learn some function called high order functions, or some people call them as lambda functions. High order functions are the functions 
which can handle like variables. So you know, when you write a function or in the methods, maybe you learn about method or functions in first year. So you can pass values to that, it call it as input parameters. So those input values most of the times are data. So like integers, strings and so on. So similarly, we can pass functions into the functions. We can pass some functions as data to some other functions. So when you do that, we call these functions a high order functions. So in this course, we will learn how to write pure functions, how to write recursive functions, how to write high order functions, and how do you combine those functions together, and so on, when you move. So it's all about function and programming language. So I think you have already learned object-oriented programming language. So object-oriented is different types of abstraction developed by the people to do efficient program. So in the object oriented abstraction, so we encapsulate data and the methods together. So we can pass, so typical programming language like C, we pass data. So similarly, we can encapsulate and create something called object where consist of the object consists of the data and corresponding methods. So then data and the methods together we can pass to a other method or other objects. So object-oriented programming is, is not really independent of the imperative and functional paradigm. Is that object-oriented programming can be done in either functional or imperative styles. So if you want to develop object-oriented programs, we can do it either in the imperative way or functional way. So objects, or basically the method of encapsulation functions, or we call it as methods, together the data. So you know most of popular object-oriented programming in the world right now is Java. So when you write a Java program and compile it, create a class for Java class, and you run that class in your application. So we write the code, maybe if you want to add something, we will write a code, maybe called sum, and it has the method main. This object is called, it has sum. And we define that object called, using keyword called class. And inside that object, there is a method called main. Method is a, anyway, some function. It has an input called string input, which we can give it. And inside that, we have some variables defined, and we add them and print them value on the screen. So similar way, if you use some other language to do the same thing, we can write that same function or same action in such way. So then we might use different compilers to compile that to the class. So maybe have you get a chance to see the final instruction set store in the file called Java class file. So if you don't do so, maybe using a tool called Java P. So you execute Java P minus C and then you give the class name. It lists down the Java VM instructions. So you know, Java is a virtual machine. So you, whatever the code you write in Java, compile or converted into the set of imperative instructions. So those instructions defined by the Java specifications. So then the Java command, or what you call it as Java interpreter, further interpret or further convert these 
Java VM instruction into the corresponding machine instructions. So you can see Java VM instructions if interest using this Java P minus C command. There you might see all these Java VM instructions are uh, imperative sequential instructions one after other. So if you want to add, you might see say store some values and then load those values into the memory and then execute add instruction and then store results in some location, they name it as three, and then maybe load, using this they say load the print methods to print those values. Whatever language you use to code, finally it ended up with similar imperative instructions. Which computer execute those one after other. So as you may see, what is Functional programming is kind of writing style. But in the low level, it's sequential execution in a computer, obviously. Do we do some parallelism in some architectures? So in order to further understand what I meant is programming styles, let's have a look, we want to add list of numbers stored in the array or what you call list. So in the imperative style, if you want to add sequence of numbers, which is stored in the list, then we need to instruct the computer, please take one num number by number in the list and add them together. So basically, you know, from the beginning, what we did, we created a place variable to store the total. And we write a for loop and take the numbers in the list one by one and add that number to the list or the variable called sum, add that number to the sum and store it in the sum. And we then take the next number, then add it and store. So take the next, add it and store. So we tell the computer how to add it. So we say our data is in array kindly take one number at a time and add that number to the results and store the results back in the result space. So if you want to give the same set of instruction using functional programming, we are not telling the computer how to do that. So we just tell the computer what we want. So what we want is the addition. So in the functional programming, we can define our addition something like that. We can say if the array is empty, the sum should be zero. If it is not empty, sum is adding the first element to the rest of the elements. Recursive, obviously. So we can pass some instruction like that. So if you pass the instruction like that, so we call it as a functional style. So we will learn a new programming language called Scala, and we'll learn how to think like functional programming. So just to tell you about, there is other programming paradigm for logic programming. So in the logic programming also, tells it's completely declarative programming like methodology. The logic programming also tells what we want. So most of the logic programming languages developed from the history right now, but so those are not so popular about software developers. Let's have a look, what are the benefits of functional programming? So the main benefit is those functions are very small, easy to understand, easy to reason about, and easy to debug, and obviously test. After test that, and we understand the input and output is correct, that's correct forever. We may not face any bug later on. So testing is perfect. 
programs are more bulletproof because of, because of that. So we write it, these programs in high level, computer convert into the real correct code, and then also it get no errors. So we, when develop the functional programming, we use the meaningful names for their functions. Because of that, readability of functional program is much more better than structure for the imperative program. And when you want to develop, Parallel and concurrent programs, so it's easy to use functional styles. So if you ever develop such parallel or concurrent program, you may understand why I say so. So obviously you will learn that in this course, so then you may understand what I mean. So before that, at the introduction, so just to give you an idea, parallel program and concurrent program is two different things. The difference between parallel and concurrent can understand by using this simple diagram. In concurrent programming, it tells about sharing a common resource. There are several parallel entities which want to access some shared resource. So for example, there are two queues of humans want to get coke from the machine, single coke machine. So then there should be a way of accessing the single coke machine in the fairable, fair way of accessing that machine for the both queues. So those things we consider on the concurrent program, how to access shared resource. So that is we call usually in concurrent. So in the parallel programming, so those queues usually independent. So there are two cook machines below so two cubes. So the people will take cooks independently from two different queues. So they take at the same time, this is parallel. This is concurrent. Obviously, when you do functional programming, there are drawbacks. The main drawback is writing a pure function is easy. If you want to combine those pure functions together to build a big applications, maybe it's confusing and hard. And people have issues on understanding some of the terminologies used in functional programming, especially like concepts such as recursions. That doesn't feel the humans, because in the human world there are no recursions happens. Kind of in their brains. So in the functional programming, usually you update so on your copy. So there are no global states or update states and so on. So typical programmers are feel uncomfortable of those styles sometimes. But if you do implement somehow real functional program, so they are much efficient and kind of error proof. The main thing is error proof because those programs build using small, small activities. <coughs> right. I think that's enough for the introduction. Let's introduce the tool I use to teach functional programming. So in, in history right now in the computer science world, there are several functional programming languages. So among those programming languages, I decided to select Scala as functional programming language. Scala refers to scalable language. Using Scala, we can implement programs in the object-oriented styles as well, if you wish. So finally, those Scala programs compile to the Java VM or the Java Virtual Machine. Because of that, so 
We could use combines, any Java libraries, Java classes, or we can directly use those things we already have with Java with Scala. So big players in the industry is use Scala heavily right now, like Twitter, LinkedIn, Intel, to develop backends. Especially when you develop concurrent and parallel programs, it's distributed way, Scala is the best language to use. So Scala consider has a general purpose programming, high level programming language created by Martin Gordesky somewhere around 2020 years ago. So the best part of it, this language, compiles the code to the JVM. So you know there are a couple of programming language which compile finally to on top to the JVM. Kotlin is some other, I guess. So Java is obviously the first language which runs on PVM, Java VM. But people have developed different programming languages, can also use to write programs. And finally, because Java specification is open, open specification, anyone can develop a new programming language which compiles their code to the JVM. So in the Scala, what they did, they combined functional, object-oriented, and all other programming style into the one set of programs. So we use Scala to teach only functional styles. In order to understand the positions of Scala, so I just show you this diagram. Right now, some people say most of most popular programming language in the world has JavaScript. Some people say it's Python. So by the way, Java and JavaScript is two different programming languages. JavaScript is mainly used on the web developments. Java is used for backends plus web plus whatever other applications. So nowadays, as you may notice, Python getting very popular because of its simple styles and huge set of libraries available. But obviously there are no doubt, Python, Java, JavaScript are the three most popular programming language in the world. But we cannot forget about C. C started somewhere around the initiation of computer science, but still survived. So, so obviously developing a C program takes time, but the most efficient programs in the world are written in C. If you want to have game engines, operating systems, all developed using C. So we have to pick our programming language based on our type of application. So in this cycle, when you think about Scala, Scala may not get a good percentage uh, out of this uh, cycle. So you see somewhere here. So there are similar popular languages available right now. One is Go and so on. But people think it might get popular. So in few years back, it was kind of getting popular. But when I, when I check in 2020, it kind of popularity, rate of Scala kind of going down similar to Ruby on Rail as well. Like languages like Go and Kotlin is getting popular. But I still decide to use Scala to teach you functional programming. So obviously Python, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, they are the most popular language in the world. In 2020, Python was the leading language and Java JavaScripts as similar portions. 
but when you take a scholar like language has a very small portion of the popularity scale but due to their features and the, due to the due to the kind of like their features very important in, in developing concurrent and parallel language, uh, parallel applications so the learning functional program such as scala is very important in this century or in this age so in order to prove that i kind of put you the salary scales of a software developer in us so usually java developers get 290000 92000 to 105000 dollars per year in us scala programmers gets up to 120000 per year this 10000 per month kind of the highest salary because very there is a demand in the crit mission critical application development areas and parallel concurrent application development areas for the functional program or functional developers software developers who know functional program so but the demand is high even though this portion is small there is a high demand for such developers but there are very few people who want on that especially with the data science applications so functional program has very high demand so we will learn how to do those things when you move on so you may have heard about Apache Spark in data science area. So they use Scala. So Scala take the good properties of all the programming language into the in world into one programming language. They inherit some features from Java, object oriented features. They inherit some functional programming features from a functional programming language, first functional programming language in the world called LIPS, ML, as well to the Scala. And they have taken some good pattern matching features from all of Erlans and to the Scala. So there is another style of doing developing parallel programs called actors. So you may heard about threads. So similar to that, there are method of doing concurrent and parallel program called actors, which are used by a language called Erlang. Those this language is heavily used by telecom operators to develop SMS switches, like for mission critical real time applications. So using Scala, we can use actors, we can use objects, we can use concepts. So that's why this language seems to be really powerful. So when you develop a program in the functional style and actor base using Scala, so it is very, very less chance it has some bugs. So, so it's kind of inherently secure. And their performance is inherently optimized. And so we can write such Scala code in few lines. So where we need to write Java code in 100 lines. In other words, 100 line Java codes can be written in Scala in two, three lines. So obviously that's good to learn, right? So I use Scala, as I said, to teach you functional programming. Because of that, I'm not teaching you Scala. So you yourself should try that. 
to learn this programming language. So benefits, I highlighted, since it's functional style, we write error-free codes. And the other main benefit is the Scala programs run on top of a Java VM. So existing old Java libraries, we can uh, use in our Scala programs. And Scala codes runs anywhere which has Java VM. I mentioned who uses Scala right now with their backend developments like Twitter implemented by Scala. They are the main people who are who behind the Scala. They are entire backend developed by Scala. And Coursera, like organization link, link, it intent. They are heavily used. Scala for backend, backend developments. There are books available in electronic form as well as printed form. Two of those books I highlighted here. But I have uploaded one book to the LMS, so that's enough if you can read to learn functional programming style. Here are the official website, Scala Language Watching. And the API documentation, you can go through this URL. And the Twitter are the people who are mainly funding this Scala development or the Scala watching. So Twitter has a separate page called Scala School to learn Scala. So these are the resources where I should start this journey. So you have to visit those things to go through this journey in order to go through this journey. Obviously, when you want to use Scala, you have to install the Scala. Scala on top of general Java VM, so you have to install Java. I think for present Scala, I want Java version 1.8 or higher version, SDK installed in your machine in order to use Scala. So you can then install Scala. So in other words, there is a built-in tool of Scala called SBT, simple build tool. Now they call it as Scala build tool SBT. So if you, by using S, uh, installing SBT, you can automatically install all those things as well. So there are various ways to run the Scala program. So most of the time I am using REPL, or what you call it as shell. Read, evaluate, print loop, or the shell of the programming language. Of all, read, evaluate, print loop, or REPL, record, prompt, to show you the styles but you can write, develop, uh, or write your code as a text file and save it, compile it, and run it as well using Scala command, like similar to Java. Similar to Java commands. So since it's run top of the Java VM, after you compile a Scala code, even you can use a Java to run that. So if you want to run the Scala program using Java, you have to just give the Scala library and Scala code, this is let's say Scala code, which can execute it by Java directly. So in the opposite as well, if you have a Java, using Scala command, you can execute Java code as well. Using Java command, you can execute Scala code. Both way, these compatible each other. Read, evaluate, print, loop is a very nice way to learn programming languages. I use Scala, Ritmel, RPL, prompt to teach functional styles in the first few lectures. After that, I move on to the serious real applications where we can use some IDE. So if you want to install Scala, there are several ways of installing Scala. So simplicity, I have give, give you a Docker file. So it's, I think you are familiar with Docker, if not, you should. So the Docker is the new way of kind of deploying applications. Instead of VMs, 
we can create what we call Docker images, that is kind of lightweight virtual machines. So those machines has what we require. So in order to learn Scala, we need small VM which can run the Scala compiler and interpreter. So I can build a Docker image for that using a base Ubuntu VM. We tell this in the Docker file from Ubuntu. That means let's take a kernel of Ubuntu, just a kernel without anything. And this is just my name. I put it as maintainer. And then after that, using Docker run command, and I tell which kind of software we are, I want to install on this kernel or this lightweight Ubuntu. So I say update this apt updates all the repositories. If you know Ubuntu, you know about apt update command. And then I say, after update, apt get install these three things on that image for initial run. Initially, what we need, a simple editor, I use Vim or VI editor. And I want to use you, I want to see you, you as in JIT to manage your repository. So I, for that, I install JIT in that VM and I install JISCAL. So if you run that in your machine, so you can instantly build a Ubuntu lightweight VM, what we call Docker image, what we call it as Docker image, which has the Scala installed on it, in it. So if you want to use that Docker, I will demonstrate in a separate video. So you put that file into a directory and in that directory, you run a command called docker build minus t and give a name for your image and say root. So then the docker will see, check the docker file install in the root directory and build a lightweight image called Scala for you. This image consists of BIM editor, JIT, and Scala interpreter and compiler. Obviously, in order to run Scala, we need Java. It automatically installed open JDK as well. So after that, we can run that image using docker run command. To minus V parameter, we can mount host file system to the docker file system. So I say tilde slash, I tell take the parent directory of my host machine and map it to the home directory in the VM. So when I start that then VM, so and change to the home of the VM, what I see is my home directory of local machine. So advantage of that is whatever I do with the image, same did in my local machine. If you do it with VM, we can't do that because VM may not see the host machine's file system. So when you use Docker, Docker see the host machine file system. So how this syntax of the Docker run has this mapping. If you don't want to map, you can skip that, but it's better to map it. And then using name, my dash dash name, I can name the Docker image I'm going to run and I give the image. So then it will create a running image. After you execute that, two, these two commands you want to execute only once. So after that, if you want to start programming at all, what you have to do is start that image using a command called docker start and this AI option tells after start that image execution, give me the prompt or give me the shell. So then I'll automatically get, get the shell where I do program. So this tells you a simple first program. So I will create a separate video on this demonstration. So I skip that. So that's it. So you, you simply now know what is programming is and what is functional programming is and what are the tools we're going to use those functional programming or to use what is the tool which we're going to learn use in learning functional programming. Scala is the tool and so on. So if you don't like formed VI and so on, so you have to use some 
integrated development environment IDE. So Atom is the very primitive IDE where we can use that to develop any kind of programming language. It has plugins to most of the programming language in the world. And simple editor, capable, simple editor. If not, you can use heavy editors like uh, Intel, J, Studio, whatever editor for do serious applications. So then you're supposed to solve these three simple programs as a start. So in the first program, as you want to implement a function where you convert a parent centigrade into the parent line. And in the second program, say you have, want to write a function called volume of the space, where I take radius as the input, it should produce the volume as the output. And then in the third, it gives some problem and asks you to implement some functions to solve this problem. So these three things are your homework. I will upload this as a assignment, first assignment of this course. And you can follow my second video, it's a demonstration, and do code this and upload it to the LMS. I will show you how to solve few problems in the second video, not all. So you have to write the code yourselves. When you're uploading assignments in this course, I'm not accepting direct submission of the codes. You have to create your own JIT account. Either you have to use GitHub or GitLab. There are two online repositories nowadays get popular. One is GitHub, other one is GitLab. So I guess you already have your own repository, your own accounts in the one of these. If not, create an account with GitLab or GitHub and create a repository for this particular course, new repository. You can use any name, maybe you can use functional programming activities or whatever as the name of the repository. And whatever you do program should push to the JIT. And you have to then submit the link of the repository as a submission. So I will check the link and the time you push your course to the link while marking the assignments. So the course should push, always put push to the repository. I am checking the repositories. Each assignment you have to upload your repository name as the submission. So, but I will check actually the date of uploading the code or pushing the codes to the repository while marking. So that's how we should continue learning in this course. That's it for the day. Thank you.